course, getting into the games industry. And the good thing about games, you've got screen skills, you've got into games, you've got Yuki. There's a lot of really good organizations to help you get in. The industry is booming and the technology that's used for games, we, we were hearing a little bit about that later on, is doing amazing things. I mean, everybody talks about the Mandalorian. We're doing a series of events. I heard we've done one in Scot Scotland yet called Seeing is Believing. Well, we're using Unreal Engine to do drama and um, to do virtual production for drama and adverts and that sort of thing with big LED screens. So the technology is being used for all sorts of things. So as you go into that future, you might be building games, you might be doing all sorts of other things. So the, the technology in, in the studio I went into in Manchester a couple of weeks ago just blew me away. It was amazing. And they were making, they made a whole advert out of Blender, which is what we use to teach children animation. So just basically screen skills, we are the skills organization for film, television, visual effects, animation, games, and immersive technology. That's what we do. Uh, and we work with industry. We endorse courses like the one at Abate. Uh, we've got games courses all over the UK. Um, but also we're working today with Intergames who've got amazing resources too. So you've got so much to help you with your next step into the industry. So make the most of this evening, ask lots of questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, 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 definitely. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah. Thank you. Woo. Margaret from Screen Skills, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Brandon from Intergames. Thanks all for coming. I'm only going to stand up for two seconds, literally, just to introduce the first speaker. We had somebody who's got COVID, so send well wishes to them. So we're one speaker down on what we had initially planned. So the lovely Ciara Dodds from Hyperluminal Luminal Games in Dundee is going to talk to you a little bit about, well, the 10 things I wish I'd known before I got my first job in games. So hand it over to um, Ciara. Let's give her a round of applause, guys. Thanks, Brandon. Hi everybody, I'm Sierra. Uh, so I'm a senior UI and UX designer at Hyperluminal Games, um, and I've been working in the games industry for just over 10 years now, but it's hidden towards 11, which makes me feel a little bit old. Uh, and before that, I was an Aberté alumni as well. So I did a degree in arts, uh, and then I did the professional masters uh, in games development. Um, so yeah, so kind of been kicking in and around the Dundee industry for about 15 years-ish. Um, so I thought it would be interesting today to tell you some of the things I've kind of learned over the years, um, rather than talking about my career into games, my journey into games, because I feel like lots of people will maybe have talked to you about that. Instead, I'm going to maybe cover a little bit of expectation versus reality of working in games. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to get started with my first one. So you won't land your dream job right away. What do I mean by that? I don't mean not to set your sights high. I just mean that if you're coming out of university or college and you're going forward to get your first job, it's really likely that you're going to be starting at a junior or an associate level, right? You're not going to come out of you know, uni and go straight into being a lead programmer or a lead artist. You're going to start at probably a junior level. And the expectation there from a company's point of view is that you're still going to be learning and growing, right? So you're going to be coming into the industry and putting all of the knowledge that you've got from university into practice, but you're still going to have a lot to learn. And so the likelihood is that the responsibilities and the type of tasks and jobs that you're doing within the company are going to be a little bit less than you might anticipate, right? But that will ramp up, right? So as you do more work and you prove yourself, you'll get more responsibility and you'll start heading towards those loftier goals that you might have. So that leaves me next one which is leave your ego at the door there's no room for ego in the games industry we are a collaborative creative industry and everyone has to work together right so there's no i in team that awful saying but it's true right everybody needs to work together and if you come into the industry thinking that you know it all and they have a bit of arrogance about you it's just going to work to your disadvantage right it's going to prevent you from learning it's going to prevent you from building really great relationships with other people in the studio which leads me to my next point. Respect is mutual, right? So treat everyone in the studio with as much respect as you want to get. And that doesn't matter what role they're in, right? They could be in QA, they could be in marketing, they might be HR or even. Every single person in the studio has got really valuable experience and knowledge that they can impart on you. 
If you treat them with respect, they're going to be much more open to giving you information and advice, and you'll be able to learn from absolutely every single person in that studio, even if they're not doing the same role as you or the same department as you. So that comes on to my next point, which is knowledge is power. So you don't know what you don't know, right? And again, you'll go through university, you'll learn lots of stuff, but I promise you that there is so much more to learn. I'm a senior now, I am still learning stuff. And as technology changes, we'll continue to be learning stuff. So again, come into the industry and expect to keep learning, right? You're always gonna be learning. And the more open that you are to that, the better that you'll grow, the further you'll progress. So it's also okay if you don't have a five-year plan, right? So if you're coming out of university, you're still sort of not quite sure what role you wanna go into, hey, that's okay, as long as you have kind of an idea Full disclosure, I came out of my undergraduate in computer arts and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I went back and did the masters and it wasn't until I was on the masters that we were working on a game project, somebody needed to do some UI. I did it and went, holy heck, I really like doing this. And that's kind of how I ended up finding my career path. And it's quite likely that you might come into the industry and start in a role and start taking on perhaps some responsibilities in a different skill set and realize that you've actually found your calling there. So, you know, don't, don't worry if you haven't got like your full career ladder mapped out right now, as long as you've got a bit of an idea of what direction you're going in. So last next one is, there's no such thing as a job for life. And I don't mean that you're gonna go in the industry and then leave games altogether after a year. I just mean that it's very, very unlikely that you're gonna stay at the same studio from now until the day you retire, right? It's just not a practical part of working life now. And that goes for any industry, by the way, not just games. Um, but it is a part of working in games development. Um, you may leave in a studio because you have decided that you would like to try a different challenge, or it might be because you want a better salary, <laughs> or it might be because you've gone through a redundancy. And there's no shame in going through a redundancy. I have been through many redundancies. I'm still here. I still love working in games. So do not let that put you off. So the next one is prestige isn't everything. What I mean by this is as you're coming out of university, you might be setting your sights for, you know, really big AAA studios who are working on really big games that you know about. Um, and while that's great to have those goals, it's also really important to think about the kind of environment you want to work in, the kind of environment that is gonna support you as a junior who has lots to learn and is gonna give you lots of opportunities and make you feel valuable. And some AAA studios, I'm gonna name any names, don't have the best culture, right? And, and we know this from recent news that sometimes they treat staff poorly and we have crunch culture and all of these other things. So be aware of that. And when you're looking at roles, don't just look at the games that they're building, find out about the culture. There's things like Glassdoor, you can go and find in reviews of previous employees and see, you know, does the culture here actually match up with my values? Is it going to be somewhere where I'm happy? I can tell you right now, I've been in games for 10 years. The job I'm doing just now is the happiest I have been because the culture there matches my values right now. So I'm happy and I feel valued and I feel worthwhile in my job. Even if the projects I'm working on might not be the most exciting ones, I feel good about myself, right? So number eight, feedback is not failure. Hopefully you're kind of learning this as you go through university or college anyway, um, but it's absolutely true once you get into industry as well. Like you will get feedback all the time, every single day on every piece of work that you're doing. That doesn't mean you're doing a bad job. It just means that this is a collaborative process and we need to iterate on work in order to get the best possible game that we can make. So get really used to that and understand that it's not personal. And if you ever get negative feedback or anything that makes you feel frustrated, ask more questions, right? Resist the urge to be angry and ask more questions so that you really understand that feedback better because I promise you there's probably something really valuable you can learn from it. So number nine, exposure will not pay the rent. Please, 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 please do not take a first job for zero pay. Like just don't do it. Um, you're worth more than that. It's not worth it at all. You're gonna put yourself at financial disadvantage, but also on the side of that, if you're applying for your first role, have a look at what the industry standard across the UK is for salary for that role and make sure that you're getting something that matches that. Don't take less and don't let a company tell you that the living standard is cheaper in Dundee 
stand your ground. You deserve to be paid fairly for what you do. Uh, and then that brings me kind of onto my last one, which is you're going to have to learn to adult, just like everybody else. And really what I mean by that is that while you're working in games, you're also going to have to think about all of those really boring adult things like pensions. And if you are joining a company full time, once you've passed your probation period in the UK, you are entitled to a pension and your company should support you in that. And make sure that you do the back end work on your side to get that all set up properly. Um, because you do not want to get 10 years into the industry and only have a pension now. That's a really bad thing. Don't do that. Um, but also, if you're thinking about going freelance, you need to make sure that you understand how to be self-employed. Uh, you need to understand how to get yourself registered on HMRC and make sure that you pay your taxes on time, because I promise you, pissing off HMRC is not a good time either. So that's my 10 points. Maybe a little bit somber, so I thought I would end on a couple of highlights. So these are some things for you to look for to and maybe if you've been building games already you may have already experienced a couple of these but these are the moments that in my first few years of making games really stood out to me and I still remember them really fondly so the first one was the very first time that I watched a kid playing and genuinely enjoying a game that I had worked on like nothing compares to it kids are absolutely gleeful they're also your harshest critic. So, so if a kid loves your games, you are, you are doing really well and it feels amazing the first time that happens. Um, the second one is the first time that you see a game that you worked on advertised, whether that's you know, on the Apple App Store or you know, a YouTube uh, trailer advert or you know, a billboard in the underground on Paris, which was my first one, which was very strange, but it was good, uh, is a really great feeling as well. Um, and then the last one is the and that you get a positive review on any one of those review websites that you'll probably all be pretty familiar with. The first time you see your game up there and it gets a good review is a really great feeling as well. So I hope that was helpful and it imparted some wisdom. Um, if you want to catch up with me, you can find me on Twitter at Sierra Dodds. I'm going to open the floor now to any questions. Anybody, somebody. When it comes to the junior uh, or the jobs out there, well, I've seen they don't uh, say that they want to train you up compared to the ones that for kids or ones that have done uni courses. Um, what way can we go to see if that's going to happen with you? Boy? Yeah, that's a really good point. I think it's stuff that you would really want to try and ask during an interview process, right? So, so we've actually recently just hired two junior UI, um, and for me, it was really important actually to bring people on and give them training because I understand exactly what Brendan said earlier, how difficult it is to get that first foot in the door. And UI as well is a particular role that we we really struggle to get people in, like in because we expect them to have so much experience already and it's just not practical. We need to get people to come in and learn so that we can have more people in the pool. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess my, my best answer to that is it depends on the culture of the company. And if you're looking for that, look for a company that's that's really focused on staff and how staff grows. It's something that's built into the, the values at Hyperlumino. We encourage growth uh, across the whole studio, regardless of, of level. So we're doing a lot of mentorship with team members that we have just now. That's at mid and senior level, as well as juniors that are coming in. So that's really baked into our culture. Um, and so that's something to maybe look for while you're researching studios. Um, and also, if it says junior on the title, then they should really be thinking about that. And it should potentially say that somewhere in the job description. But if it doesn't, definitely ask about it in an interview. Any other questions? Yeah. Talk, you know the trope when you find as a junior developer, they want five years experience as a junior. How common is that? Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 it is quite common. Um, it's something, again, that you know we, we I personally have tried to adjust for with the two roles that we put out for the juniors. Um, I, it's a really difficult one to balance and to fight because how do you get experience without getting into games? And then, you know, it's kind of just this, this revolving door of I can't get experience because I need to get into games to get experience, but I can't get into games because I don't have the experience. So yeah, I feel you on that. Um, I think if it's a junior role, they should be expecting that you're a graduate or that you maybe have one or two years experience. Otherwise, they have no idea what a junior is. <laughs> like a junior should be someone who's coming either straight from university and has no experience and needs training or has maybe been in a role for a year 
and is looking to shift. So there's still a lot of like learning and growing to do there. So yeah, if, if they've got that, that's maybe a little red flag. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I can ask, like, what's like your day-to-day -day, like, work life kind of like? Sure, yeah, so it's, uh, it's pretty hectic right now. Um, so I'm, I'm a senior and I have two juniors and a mid UI underneath me now. So a lot of my day is actually kind of, I suppose, a little bit management and mentoring. So I'm doing a lot of onboarding them and training and doing workshops with them on different skills to do with user interface design and user experience design as well. Uh, so I do a lot of that and I'm also working across three projects at the moment, so I'll be dipping in and out of tasks for that as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very busy. I'm kind of involved in kind of design calls, and I'll also be doing physical UI design as well. So pretty, pretty varied. <laughs> yeah. You talked about research on UK average for the role, but many companies always like hide the yes. on their job. Yes. Sort of how do you how you go about finding the yeah, so there there should be sites that will, I'll see if I can find this, but there should be sites where you can research what the average is. I can't remember the site now, but there is ones uh, that will tell you what the average is. Yeah, Glassdoor. Yeah, Glassdoor. yeah, there's a few. I think Indeed does it as well. Um, and I think LinkedIn usually has that info as well. Yeah, game dev. Um, so you can get a ballpoint of what the average is. Lots of studios don't put it on their advertising uh, for applications. And usually, if you go into an interview, they might ask you what you want. And if they do that, if you have that number down, you're going to look really professional because you've went and you've done your research. And you're also putting a value on yourself and saying, I'm worth this much. And if you're a graduate of Aberdeen University or any other college that's done a games course, then yeah, you do, you do deserve to come in at like a decent salary. So, so definitely do that research because it will help you a lot. And if you come in it and you get that base salary that like starting salary good then you've got good salary to build up from but if you come in low then you've got extra work to get yourself up somewhere where you might want to be so yeah what time do you finish work at Apogee because I've seen that some, uh, some companies they sort of encourage you and there's um Google was doing it recently there's a they offered free food for staff but the free food started at six which was a sort of yeah, so I mean, it's varied for me right the way across my career where I currently work. I finish at five, but we also have flexi time. So I can start at half eight and finish at half four. I could start at 10 and finish at six too. Um, but usually I'll do like eight to five. Uh, the caveat to that is that we have a couple of members of our team who because we do a lot of work for hire, we have clients who are external to us and some of them are in the US. So we have some members of our team who have to communicate with those teams that are in a different time zone. So we have, for example, our producer sometimes has calls between like six and seven, um, but we generally will kind of accommodate that. So he would adjust like his working day so that, you know, he works a little bit later and he ends a little bit later. Uh, but generally, within Hyperluminal, we we try to avoid any kind of crunch culture. Um, we do do sort of team building events, uh, but they are entirely outside of work parameters. So, for example, back in, I think it was November, just before kind of the COVID rules strictened up again, we had a, a big event. Uh, we rented out a room in uh the Marriott um, and all met up and just did kind of talks, like little talks like these to each other and little learning things about how to deal with clients and different little kind of skills sharing situation. But it was just basically a chance for us to all hang out together and get to know one another because we had all been working remotely for two years. So, uh, so we tend to do that. We would kind of separate those kind of things that are considered like team building from work. So you're not coming to it and expecting to also be working, you're coming to it and doing. So that day was on a Monday and that whole day was blocked out and nobody was expected to be in the office and working. We were doing that and that was our working day. So so that's what we tend to do. Um, not every studio is the same, unfortunately. But yeah, be wary of places that say they'll give you pizza for doing overtime and stuff like that. But that's not renewing that's not renumination. Like make sure you get paid for the time that you're in the office, definitely. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Yara. That was absolutely amazing.
lift that up a little bit because my next speaker is six foot something, so he's going to need it up here. Uh, next speaker you may know, he's a Scottish games industry legend, I think would be fair to say. So you may recognize his face already. He's sitting there at the back wondering who I'm talking about. Uh, next up, we have Colin McDonald. Uh, he works over, I can't remember his role, I'm sorry, at Rivet Games in Sterling, but you may know him better as the creator of Games Jobs and Games Talks Live. Uh, so please give a round of applause to the wonderful Colin McDonald. Awesome. Thank you very much, Randy. I, I was standing there next to Paul Farley and I genuinely didn't know who you were talking about because you're going to hear from Paul later and he ticks all those boxes, six foot, games industry legend, all that stuff. Um, I know a bunch of people here are Aberté graduates. I'm, I'm also an Aberté graduate. I graduated before the, the games courses started. However, I, I didn't have the exam results to get into a university. So I actually joined Aberté when it was uh, the tech, DIT. Um, and then in my second year, it turned into a university. So that was a result. So timing, timing is everything in your career. That's, that's the number one rule. To give you, oh, have a look at the modern technology. Wow. Um, um, to give you a, a little bit of background about me, just because it will play into some of the, the things I'll say. I've, I've basically been in the games industry for about 30 years. Started here in Dundee, basically doing little things in my, my bedroom in my mum's my, my house. Um, ended up doing a port of a, a little game called Lemmings, which was obviously made here in Dundee. Ended up working with Mr. Mr. Paul Farley that you're about to hear from on um, the early Grand Theft Auto games. Um, left what had become Rockstar at that point to join Dave Jones when he set up uh, what became Real Time Worlds, um, I was the studio manager there. We grew up to about 300 people, raised about $100 million, and went bust quite spectacularly. If, um, if anyone remembers that story, I still cry a little bit when I go past the West Market Gate and see our old offices that's now a, is it a gym, I think, and something else. Um, I then went to Channel 4. I was Channel 4's games commissioner for uh, six or seven years. So I commissioned a whole bunch of um, games to, to link in with some amazing Channel 4 shows that I'm sure you'll watch, like um, Hollyoaks and Made in Chelsea and stuff like that. Everyone a big fan? Good. Um, we also did some um, uh, some nicer ones. We did a game of The Snowman. We did, um, we did a, a game for Stand Up to Cancer, all that good stuff. I left Channel 4 about 2017. And since then, I've done a mix of things. Um, there's a, a couple of local... Uh, developers uh, I work with. But as Brandon says, one of the things I've been doing recently um, has been Games Jobs Live. So this was actually something I only started when COVID hit because I realized the industry suddenly had a massive problem. You know, it was really hard to get into the industry. It was really hard for companies to recruit. It was it, that matchmaking process was just really hard. But the fact that the entire planet suddenly had to go online for absolutely everything meant Games Jobs Live was was really easy to do. So it's basically a series of recruitment events, all online. I bring on a studio, let them chat for five, 10 minutes about what they do. It gets broadcast out on YouTube and people then chat to the companies on Discord, easy. But no one else seemed to do it. So I, I'm one of these people, I'm like, well, if nobody else is doing it, I suppose I'd better do it. So I think I've now done something like 40 of these events. If I'd, 20,000 people attend them, um, God knows how many views on YouTube, all that kind of good stuff. But as well as doing the events, I thought it'd be useful to start collating some of the data around the, the jobs that we've got in the UK. Um, so I'm standing right in front of the slides, that's not good. Um, this is some of the data uh, pulled from our most recent report. So if you go onto the Games Jobs Live website, you can get this every month for free. It's just a report we put up. Right now, across the UK, there's 2,760 jobs going right now. And that's just gone up and up pretty much for the last 15 months that we've been tracking this data. And there's a wee split there of how it, how it splits across different disciplines. And I mean, there's probably no huge surprises, you know, lots of art jobs, lots of code jobs, not so many writing jobs, audio jobs. But of course, if you're looking for a job in that sort of field, you've also got less competition. 
So your, your odds are probably not dramatically different whether you're looking for an audio job or a, a, an art job. Um, more opportunities, more competition. Where it, it can get a little depressing when you look at initially, I've done an extract of the jobs um, just in Scotland. So in Scotland, um, if I quickly tally those, there's about 230 jobs in Scotland right now in games. This data is about a week old. But to um, Sierra's point, that a, a lot of it is you know people are looking for experience. And out of those 230, only 10 are flagged as junior. So when you're looking for a job, if this is your first job, you're competing with, I mean, even just the number of people in this room. If this was all the people applying for those 10 jobs, you know, you're, you, you've got a four to one chance, but it's not just the people in this room. You're competing against everyone else that's graduated at the same time from Aberty, everyone from the other universities, and a whole bunch of other people that have done cool stuff that haven't gone through university. So you have to stand out. Your degree, whether you've got a degree or not, but if you do, it's a great start, but it's it's not going to get you a job. It's not enough on its own because think of all the other people you've graduated with. They've got the same bit of paper as you. You have to stand out. So my bits of advice tonight are going to boil down to some really simple things, but one of them is basically just do stuff, make your stuff, make yourself stand out. Um, and you'll need to just be creative about what's what's best for you. Um, one of the bits of advice that sort of followed me throughout my career is, it's an old Confucius quote of finding a, a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life. And it's, it's been absolutely true for me that a lot of my job is emails and meetings and spreadsheets and, and Microsoft pro project. But because we're doing it all for the purpose of something that's inherently fun, I don't, I don't mind it. You know, if I was doing all this for a bank or a phone company or something, I would be bored stupid. But somehow emails and spreadsheets about making a game are somehow a bit more bearable. So I, I do work long hours by choice. Um, but it's because I love what I do. I love seeing the end result and I love seeing the, the game in the shop and I love seeing people, you know, the kids and the people talking about your gate. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the best reward ever. Um, and if you can find an area and maybe just being in games is, is enough, but within that, if you find an area that you absolutely love, even if you work hard, even if you do work long hours, whether it's bribed by food at Google or whatever else, it, it doesn't feel like work and you need to make your own decision on whether that's the right thing to do. But from a personal point of view, I would I would rather work 60 hours in a job I love than 30 in a job I hate. You know, I would take that any any day of the week. Um, I got sent this message a couple of days ago and I know Brandon picked up on it when I, I tweeted it or something. We've got a, a game jam going on at the, at the moment as part of Games Jobs Live. And the reason I do it is because particularly if you're looking for your first job in the industry, getting that first bit of experience is a nightmare. And I absolutely agree with all Sierra's advice about not taking jobs that don't pay. I mean, not just that it's it's unfair to you, but actually you're not gonna be valued as much. If somebody's not paying you, they're not gonna value your contribution. They, they, will, they will think you've done a better job if they pay you than if they haven't because they've had to put their, their hand in their pocket. So get get people to pay you what you're worth. Um, but if you can't do that, game jams are amazing. We started doing these game jams, we've now done five or six, um, and we get them judged by industry. And it's a great way of firstly, just giving people more practice, more experience. The, the, the more things you've done, the better you get at what you do. And even those of us that have been around the industry for decades, in the scheme of things, we're still rubbish at what we do. You know, you can make dozens of games over, over dozens of years and you've still got to learn something new every day. So the, the more real experience you can get, and it's not just technical skills, it's the soft skills or smart skills, whatever the phrase is these days about working with other people, seeing how things involve, learning not to overscope, learning how to plan so that you don't have to crunch. All this, it's absolutely invaluable. And this studio, and this was a big studio, by the way, 
sent me this tweet a couple of days ago because what this person, and I've got no idea who it is, what this person seemed to have learned from taking part in sort of a semi-professional game jam was really, really valuable to them. And this was just one week of their, their, their life. This wasn't spend, you know, the next two years of your life doing thousands of game jams, but pick stuff. It doesn't have, doesn't have to be the games jobs, live game jams, um, into games, do a bunch of stuff. It, you know, there's, there's a million things you can do, but you've got to do some of it. If you do none of it, you've got your degree and you're in the same position as everyone else. Do something to make yourself stand out. You know, you've got to think of it how, th from the perspective of the employer. You know, why are they going to choose you? When people are going through CVs, and I've, I've been there myself, where you put up a, a position, particularly a junior position, and you get a couple of hundred CVs to look at for that position. And I, I swore I wouldn't do this, but when you're in that position as a hiring manager, I timed myself once. You end up spending about seven or eight seconds on average looking at each CV because you can tell. I mean, it sounds horrendous when you spend hours, put, you know, years putting together the experience and hours putting together the CV. But as a hiring manager, if that is your job, you can actually assess fairly accurately just in a couple of seconds whether this person's got what you're looking for or not. So you have seven or eight seconds to stand out and be put in the maybe pile rather than the no pile, because that's all there is. There's no yes pile at this stage. So you've got to do something that is going to jump. There's no point burying it deep in your CV. You've got to give yourself some experience, work on something that that, that's, that ends up shipping, take a game jam game and release it on Steam. Wow, that would be amazing. And you know what? It doesn't really cost very much. It's not very hard to do. Anything like that, just find a way to stand out. Less is more is something I still haven't really learned properly, but almost everything I do, whether it's the scope of a game, whether it's trying to sell myself or sell something, you always try and just throw everything in the kitchen sink in. And you know what? You kind of get judged by the weakest link. And whether it's your portfolio or the game you're scoping or whatever it is you're turning yourself to, look at it really harshly, prioritize, strip half of it, maybe even 90% of it out, and leave the very, very best. What's in your portfolio should be your very best. Because if somebody's looking at everything you've put together, they're also assessing your judgment. And if you've got a lot of mediocre stuff in there, what that says to them is not, oh, you're occasionally capable of something amazing. It, it says you don't have great judgment. So cherry pick, do, you know, and it's the same with scoping out a game. The, the best games in the world, the mechanics are actually not that complicated. And we've seen it time and time again with the games we've tried to make that by simplifying it, we think we're killing the game by stripping out the best bits. Actually, it just means we can focus on the best bits as long as we, as long as we do the right thing and strip out the rubbish bits. Um, but focus and, and do less. Harder to work, the luckier you get. Again, um, I'm not especially talented. I'm not especially bright, um, but I work really hard. And I've got really lucky over my career. And almost everything I've tried to do, I've kind of failed at what I thought I was aiming for. But because I worked so hard and because I spoke to so many people and I tried so many things, something better than what I was hoping for actually came out of it. Um, I've ended up working with a bunch of prestigious companies on a bunch of prestigious games. None of it was in the plan, but it's it's worked out way better than I could have hoped for. For a you know a guy from Dundee, you know, growing up here, um, you know, whenever it was 30, 30 years ago, I was in school here. Dundee's come a long way. I mean, Dundee wasn't a great place thirty years ago. There wasn't the opportunity um, back then. But I, I worked really hard, and you you. You just make opportunities, but you've got to do stuff and you've got to tell people that you've done stuff. Otherwise, it's not going to go anywhere. And then the final um, uh, pithy quote that I'll leave you with, um, um, someone said this and it sort of resonated once about networking as marketing. And I, I, I always thought networking was something older, more salesy people did. Um, 
And it was only when I'd been in the industry a couple of years, I thought, oh no, okay, right, I need to start networking and stuff. But actually, you all need to do it all the time. And you, you're doing it by being here tonight. So hats off to you. You're doing it better than everyone else that hasn't chosen to come along tonight. So well done. But you need to look at hundreds of opportunities to just keep speaking to people. And it doesn't have to be, you know, badgering some big wigs. The, the more people that are doing the same as you, that you can potentially partner up with, get involved in a game, jam with, that's all potential colleagues. Because when some of those folk become hiring managers, you're going to start, you know, if, if they know you, you're going to immediately stand out to them. They're going to know what you're brilliant at. And if, you know, if they're looking for, for the skills they know you've got, you've already got a massive advantage. If you do start networking with some of the, the Dundee studio managers, you, you know, same thing. They're going to get to know you. You get involved in game jams. Everyone's going to start to recognize your name. You can go to conferences. But even online, and, and I mean, thankfully, in-person events are coming back. But even online, I've seen people get jobs from Reddit and from chat forums and just from being on Skype calls and all these things. Don't think it has to be at an in-person conference. Anything you do where you're interacting with another person, whether it's online or in person, is networking. And you need to tell them what you've done. You don't need to turn into some sales touting snake oil salesman, but you just need to say, hey, I'm so-and-so, this is, this is what I do. And then that way, if they're interested, they'll ask you for more information, you can chat, you get to know a few more people. And it's amazing how, how those things come back to benefit from you. So all this boils down to do stuff and tell people what you do. Thank you. Any questions? Or, yeah. Any questions? Is it more difficult to get in as a as a mature student or as an older person? Um, there's pros and cons. I'd probably say on average it probably is a little more difficult. Um, but there's pros because you know you'll have learnt a lot of experience in other things, not necessarily in games. One of the one of the problems big studios have with with hiring juniors is not knowing how grown up some of them are. So you're going to be grown up than some of the others. Um, um, but equally, they might be worried you've got into some bad habits. Um, so y y you're still going to need to work hard. You, you don't have it easier. You might have it more difficult. Um, but I think you need to focus on what your, you know, what your positives are and, and show, right, I've, I've, I've I learned this in, you know, from whatever it was you were doing from the ages, of, you know, 22 to 25, I was doing this. Right, this is what I learned from that. This is how I've applied to that. That's why, you know, why you've decided to do what you're doing now. So you need to show the value from of your age, you know, turn it into a positive. Um, what do you think are the pros and cons of that uh, if you manage to land a job? So, so it's the pros and cons of having a three-year degree without honours um, as opposed to the four-year one. I, I, I mean, it's it's not that different a, a question. Because, you know, there is pros and cons. The, you, you know, you will get, you will in theory have learned more in four years. You'll have, you'll have done more. Um, but if you can graduate after three years and have an amazing portfolio, then, you, you know, a studio is getting you even younger and you're in theory going to spend more more time with them. I, I think it comes down to you. I mean, if, if your portfolio is amazing, um, your age is irrelevant, you know, and whether you've done three years or four years, it, it kind of comes down to what you've done with it.
Yeah, your work speaks for itself. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, I, again, some companies will look at it one way or another. Some might go, oh, he's too old or so he's too young or whatever. But you know what? Everyone's going to take a different view on that. You can't, you can't base anything on that. You, you just need to take what you've got. Take your three years, your four years, your you know whatever your thirty years, and just go right. This is what I've done with it. This is what I'm capable of. This is what I can do for you. and being able to just tell which ones are the ones you're looking for and which ones aren't. Do you know, like, look it up if you look for that CV that makes it stand out? It, it, it's... So the question for the live stream is, is there any specifics that you look for in a CV when you're assessing it in seven or eight seconds? I mean, I guess the, the obvious things are you you you're looking for something that's not that doesn't rule itself out. You know, if it's just a really badly presented CV, um, and again, everyone's different. But personally, if it's a one-page CV, I'm immediately suspicious. It feels like there's not enough there. If it's a four or more pages, then I'm suspicious that this person doesn't know. You know, unless they've done, you know, unless unless they're, you know, got decades of experience. Two or three pages is usually the norm. To be outside of that, you need a really good reason. Um, if there's just something weird about it, I, I don't know if there's if there's some weird work or the spelling mistakes or some or it's addressed to a different company. You know, you, you're almost looking for reasons to discount people because you're trying if you're trying to get through 200 CVs. You don't have time to give every single person hours of consideration. You know, so you're. You're looking for reasons to rule people out, being harsh, you know? Um, and then within that, you, you're, you're looking for keywords. You know, you're, you're, you're looking for, right, actually, you know what? This needs someone that's, that's done a bunch of game jams, or this needs someone that's worked solo or worked in a, in a team. Um, so whatever it is, is your strength, you want to make sure that jumps out. So if you're, you know, if you're a, a, a really strong I'm going to struggle to think of a good example now, but because um, if you were a strong concept artist, your portfolio would talk for itself. But whatever it is, you, you want that to be obvious within seven seconds of looking at your 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 CV. There's no point burying it too deeply. So almost almost a test would be: do your CV, show it to someone for seven seconds, and say, okay, what would you remember? And if what they remember isn't what you want to be hired for, redo it. Game jams and stuff. Is transfuser a good way to the Yes. Yeah. Uh, the question is whether transfuser is good. Yeah, I, absolutely. Transfuser is brilliant. I, I've got a vested interest. I'm on the advisory board, but I'm on the advisory board because I think it's brilliant. Yeah. I, I'll be around. So. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, hopefully that was, well, it definitely was super insightful. Lots of really, really great stuff in there. I really love the quote about kind of, um, you know, find a job that you love and you'll never work a day in, in your life. Although I love my job, but I have worked some days. <laughs> um, uh, the next uh, speaker is probably also actually a certified Scottish games industry legend. I'm now going to actually say Ciara is also a Scottish games industry legend. You guys are in a steam company tonight. Um, that gentleman is Paul Farley, who's sitting somewhere over there, who is the founder of Scotland's first games publisher. And he's going to tell you a little bit more about the work that they do at Firestoke, possibly his long, illustrious career journey um, through games in Dundee and, and wider. So yeah, big round of applause to the wonderful Paul Farley. Hello, good evening. And thanks, Brandon, for that introduction. Um, I think when people say you're an industry veteran, or a legend, I think what they really mean, it's just a nice way of saying you're really old. Um, so thanks for that. Um, I am really old, or I feel really old. Um, great to see you all. Um, so tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about what happens after you've made a game. And I'm kind of assuming by that, it kind of means that you want to go on and maybe create your own studio rather than get a job. So I'm going to pretty much fly in the face of everything you've heard today, which has been brilliant advice about getting a job. A lot of it also applies. Um, 
to setting up your own studio. So I'll tell you first a little bit about myself and my journey. Um, I didn't ever make a conscious decision to start a game studio. I actually never made a conscious decision to get into games at all. Um, my career has been really a series of really happy events um, and quite accidental events. Um, I came to Dundee to study architecture, um, which was great for a couple of years and terrible for a couple of years. Um, I think when you are doing something, you wake up every morning, you think, what am I, what am I doing? You know, this is, this is not me. Um, it becomes a real chore and it doesn't really matter what you're doing. Um, so after four years, I dropped out. I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do next. Um, I took on numerous jobs um, delivering stuff, so the equivalent of doing Amazon deliveries. Back then, it was Littlewoods Catalogs. If you're old enough, you'll remember that. Um, what else did I do? I worked on a farm. I worked in various shops. Had a great job working for Super Snaps, which was before digital photography. had analog photography. You actually printed stuff out. That was a lot of fun, and not for the reasons you would think. And maybe tell you a bit about that later. So I had loads of jobs, no idea what I was going to do, um, and then job advert came up, and a couple of friends that were working for a company called DMA Design Dundee flagged up to me and said, uh, "You might be really interested in this as a, a job as a game designer in Dundee um, in video games." And at that point, I had absolutely no idea that anyone in the UK actually made games. I had a, a spectrum of the ZX81 and everything else, and um, later on, you know, snares and stuff. But I had no idea that you could actually make games in, in Scotland or in the UK. Um, so I was just completely fascinated with this. So I went along to the interview just for a laugh, just to see what would happen. Um, and somehow I got the job. Um, and the first game I worked on was Grand Theft Auto. And it's been downhill ever since then. Um, but anyway, um, so thinking about that question of like, so I've made a game. Right, so maybe you've done game jams, maybe at university or college, um, you've made a game together with friends. Maybe you're in a studio and you're thinking, okay, we're going to make a game in our spare time. Um, what are the what are the next steps? And actually, 16 years ago, that was a question I was asking myself. Almost exactly 16 years ago today, quite strange. Um, I was I'd spent about five years working for a mobile games publisher and developer um, based in Dunfermline. It was pretty successful. It was a great job, a great team, culture is brilliant. Um, having a lot of fun, um, but I was pretty bored. And so I was looking for something new to do. And at that time, uh, my colleague was ill and I was taking his job. And his job was the kind of fun job of, sort of scouting and evaluation of new games. And so he was getting like hundreds of games sent to him like pretty much every week. And I took on that job and it was completely crazy. But there was this guy in Dundee who just graduated from Abertay called Bert, um, quite unlikely fella um, at the time. So Bert was sending me these emails with these game ideas and stuff. I just thought that's kind of weird. Um, his stuff was interesting, it was quite creative, but he couldn't do, he was doing coder art. He really could not do any art to save himself. I thought, oh gosh, you know, this guy just needs an artist and he'd be off and away. And at the same time, someone I'd also worked with previously, um, Jamie, had been made redundant. I thought, ah, oh, here we go. We've got Jamie, who's head of art, who's now redundant, and Bert, who really needs an artist. Let's get together and see what happens. So um, we all met in the DCA, introduced them, and uh, long story short, they decided to continue to make Bert's game together and everything else. And it really, the game sucked at that point. It was called Escape Flooding Labyrinth, which is not a very catchy name for a game at all. So we, we kind of had, had a look at his game and stuff, and we started to come up with ideas how we'd improve it and everything else. And you know, before we left, we were like really excited about what that game could be. And, and somehow I got dragged into it. And at that point, I was, wasn't even really kind of looking for a, a different job or anything else. But I thought, well, I'll help the guys out for a couple of months and see what happens. And a couple of months went by, and we were just having so much fun making this game. Um, the question kind of came up. So, well, what are we going to do with this? You know, we're going to go for it. You know, there's an opportunity here to, to create a studio um, and to go out and, and do it ourselves. And I don't know whether it's Jamie or Burt, but they were saying, well, you know, why work for the man when you can be the man? I said, well, okay, you know, what have we got to lose? Um, only the fact my wife was pregnant, uh, we had a house, you know, a pretty decent job, um, quite a lot to lose as it happened. So we uh, remortgaged the house and the guys took loans and put money on credit cards and, and we lived the startup dream and, and, and took that jump. And it's, so it's not easy. Getting started is not easy. So whether you're uni or you're coming from industry to get into it, it's, it's absolutely not easy. Um, but I think if Colin said, if you work really hard and if you're in the right place at the right time, um, you can have huge success. Um, would I change a thing? I absolutely would not change a thing. Um, I think like being your own boss, being um, you're part of a small creative team and seeing something grow is just the most rewarding thing ever. I think Sarah put some um, notes up there in terms of you know, if you wake up every morning, you love what you do, it doesn't feel like work. You know, if the company culture is great and supportive, well, actually, if you're the one responsible, part responsible for that culture, 
how rewarding is that, right? Especially when things work out. And usually things don't work out very well. There's a lot of failure, which I'll come to in a second. But when things work out, it's very rewarding. So I was thinking, um, got a few notes. 16 years ago is a long time, so the memory's fading a bit, you know, a few gray hairs now as well. So I made a few notes just in terms of things that I thought it would be good to share um, if you are thinking about going on that journey. Um, I think the first thing to say is, if you are, speak to people that have already done it. Um, there's loads of people in Scotland, there's loads of people in Dundee that have done it. Yeah, and they've done it quite successfully. That you know, they've run a sustainable, growing games business. Um, it's actually not that hard, but there's some obvious mistakes that pretty much everyone makes that you can avoid by speaking to people. So as Colin said, like network like crazy. Um, look people up on LinkedIn, phone them up, email them, even you know, even ask them to go for coffee. Um, yeah, I'm really happy. You know, if someone's looking to set up a business, I'm more than happy to kind of meet up with you for you know half an hour, an hour, have lunch and just chat through what you're planning. Um, don't have all the answers. I don't think anyone has all the answers, but just to know that you're not alone and that other people have done it and have done it successfully is, is really helpful. Um, beyond that, have a look at your team. Um, so it's kind of hard to, to make games and publish them and do it all yourselves and make money and, and be successful. There are a few exceptions to that rule, but I wouldn't recommend doing it yourself. Um, it's good to have people to share the journey with. So get your team together. Um, think about what you need. Obviously, you need all of the disciplines and skills required to make a game. You've probably got most of that already. Um, but also consider, like, is there anyone you're concerned about? You know, if you come out of uni, you've been mates together. You know, there's maybe like you know five or six of you. Things have been great. You've done some game jams together. It's been really successful. Do you really know the other people? Like, really know them? When the going gets tough, will they be there? Or would they bail? Um, you know, can you trust everyone else um, in your team? It's hard. It's a bit like getting into a marriage or a long-term relationship. You know, you're going to have some good times. You're going to have some bad times. So think very carefully about who you're going into business with or building a studio with. Um, if there are issues, deal with it there and then. <laughs> Please don't procrastinate. Don't put it off for another day. The longer you leave it, the worse it gets, right? Um, we had some issues with TAG in the early days. Made loads of mistakes. We'll try not to do that again next time. Um, I think the next thing to say, you know, following on from that, is thinking about company culture as well. Um, make sure that you're setting up with people that you align with, you've got similar interests, you've got similar outlook on life. Um, they say don't get into business with your friends and family. Um, it's not always the case. There's lots of brothers, lots of sisters actually working well in, in the games industry and been pretty successful. Um, but you know, broadly speaking, it's a good idea. Um, if you are concerned about how it could work out, if you are involved with you know, your, your best mates or whatever, um, you know, do you really want to risk um, that friendship just for, just for your studio, just for your business? Um, definitely have someone on the team that wants to take responsibility for the business side of things, right? Um, I was on a call a couple of weeks ago and we were just talking about, um, I think it was with one of the local accountancy firms, and they were just wanting to know how to really support games business. And they asked the question, like, how do you know when a team that's coming out of uni or a new team, how are they going to make it? How do, you, how do you identify that? And I think the one thing that we all um, identified on that call was the fact that there's always one person on that team that says, okay, I may be a coder or an artist or a designer or you know, audio person, but I'm going to do the business stuff. I'm going to take responsibility for watching cash flow, making sure we've got money coming in. I'm going to fill out forums. I'm going to register the business. I'm going to do all of that stuff. You need someone to take that, or at least you need to share it around the team. But ideally, you just want one person that can take, take a lead on that stuff. So the formal stuff, the really boring stuff, you have to set up and register your company, right? Really easy, like it takes five minutes, really not hard um, and doesn't cost. Um, very much at all. You will need a lawyer, an accountant as well. Um, you know, these are kind of like evil, evil words to say around games, right? Um, are they necessary evils? I don't know. Hopefully, there's no accountants or lawyers in the room. Like, you know, they they can be a bit difficult to work with at times, but find good ones, and they will be a massive extension to your team, and they will support you and. and help you in ways that you just won't understand right so find good ones locally there are loads of good ones that have got lots and lots of experience with games companies um i won't say that they'll work for free they might work for free for a little while if you ask them nicely um you're basically you basically they're thinking that you and your team could be the next rock star right so they'll they'll work for peanuts to begin with um, to get you started with the view that they'll make money in future years. So don't be overall that, okay, if I bring an accountant on board or bring a lawyer on board, it's going to cost me hundreds or thousands. It's not necessarily the case, right? If you don't ask, you don't get. So definitely ask, but you will need them. Um, 
the other thing, just in terms of about team dimension, is think about your cap table, your capitalization table, right? This is how you divvy up who owns what in your business. It is super, super, super important, right? A lot of folk will just skip over this and go, okay, there's three of us, so we'll divide things equally three ways. Is that right? It might be, but ask the question, okay? If there's one person really leading it and driving it, maybe they should get a little bit more. Um, if there are folk that are coming onto the journey later on, maybe they should get a little bit less than everyone else. But you know, I think that's something you have to have a very open and honest conversation with your team about quite early on and get that sorted out because it will cause <laughs> issues later on, um, particularly if you're really successful. It's like, well, what do we do with dividends? Right, we've got all this profit. How do we divvy it up amongst ourselves? Um, maybe someone wants to buy the business further down the road. Like, what do we do with the proceeds of that? You don't want people feeling that they've got a chip on their shoulder or that you know they're annoyed with the fact that they're maybe getting less than others. So have that conversation early um, and be quite upfront about it. Um, it's been quite a lot of chat already tonight about values, and you know we've spent, we just started Firestock, which is a new publisher. We spent a really long time on vision and values, right? So vision is basically your north star. What is it you're trying to achieve? Okay, what's your five-year or ten-year plan? Um, and it can be something really simple, like you know we want to make ten million pounds a year by you know, year five, or it can be something a little bit more aspirational. It's like you know, we want to be the number one games publisher in the world, or we want to make the best RPG games in the world. That's great, but you've got to have some sort of vision, something that's going to inspire people and draw other people to you. Values talks about not what you're going to do. So we're going to be publishing. You guys might be developing, but it's how you do it. And this is becoming more and more and more important. And we're starting to see like loads of negative press. Um, I won't mention any names. I know at Colin's event a few weeks ago, I mentioned a name. I won't do that. But um, you know that you know these days, if you say that you believe one thing and you actually act in a completely different way, you know that lack of integrity is seen and it doesn't reflect well on you. And might, people might choose not to do business with you. They might choose not to work for you. Um, so we mentioned Glassdoor. There are lots of other kind of you know, review sites out there. But look, it's a small industry. People talk, right? Um, if you get a bad reputation for treating people appallingly bad, while at the same time you're saying, well, actually, we're really inclusive. We love to look after our team and you, know, all the rest of it. It doesn't cut the mustard anymore. So think very much about what are your values as individuals, but also collectively as a team. What are the things that are important to you that you want to um, basically define, you know, be the DNA of your team, not just at the start, but as you grow. If you spend time on that early, I guarantee you know, that investment will pay off long term. A um, couple more. Create a business plan. <laughs> so there's an old saying which says, um, if you fail to plan, you're going to fail or something like that. Um, it's pretty much right, actually. So the business plan is all about taking all of those great ideas that you've got this grand vision that you have, the values that you've collectively come together and discussed and put it together in one document. Is it for investors? Is it for banks? Is it for your accountant? Is it for lawyers? Who's it for? Well, it's for all of those people, but it's mainly for you. It's a real sanity check to take everything you've talked about and distill it down into a fairly concise, small document that really details how you're going to take um, the ideas that you have and put them into action and achieve that vision. Um, now, a business plan is a bit like a game design document, right? Some people say it's not worth the paper it's written on, but I wouldn't aspire to that because I'm a designer. What I would say um, is that it needs to evolve and change over time, right? So the business and the studio that you start on day one and start to, you know, start to build and create the foundations for won't be the same business in five years' time. But it gives you an idea of like, okay, how can I break down this grand vision into achievable steps? What are we going to do in the first three months? What are we going to do in the first six months? What are we going to do in the first year? So super important to get the business plan together. Um, within that business plan, really good to break down. What is it you're making? So what's your product? Who is it for? Right. So what's your market or your audience? How are you going to generate interest in that product, which is marketing? And then how are you going to close? How are you going to make sales? All of that should be in your business plan in a lot more depth than you know, I've explained there. And it doesn't matter if your studio is going to be self-publishing your own content or whether it's going to be doing work for hire for other people. The same principles apply. You might be selling to your players, or you might be selling to another publisher, or you might be selling to another corporate business. Um, the same things count. And your financial projections are where it all comes together. So some people are like, oh, I hate spreadsheets. I hate Excel. I hate numbers. It's not about the money. And that might not be your motivation. My motivation is not to make tons of money. It's great if it happens on the side. My motivation is to have fun, to go on a journey, to learn. Um, I want to be creative and part of a creative industry. 
but also the thing that facilitates that is profit. If we're not making profit, everything else falls apart. So you need to think about how are we going to make money, what's that going to look like, and have a plan for that so that if you're running behind, you can make adjustments and changes to your business accordingly. Um, the final thing, <laughs> my favorite thing, this is the one thing that I really hope you take away. Um, if you know everything else I say, um, this is the one, right? Don't take this personally, but your game probably sucks, right? It probably does. I'm not going to say it definitely sucks, but it probably sucks. Um, our first game became Dead Water. Um, it was, it was kind of a nice little action adventure where you escaped a, a flooding ship. It was on mobile. Um, the reason why our game sucked was that the game was way too complex for mobile. This is before the days of touchscreen. So you've got a mobile keyboard or keypad, and um, it had about 12 different keys per entry. So and I don't know, I think it was about 12 keys on a mobile, or there was 12 keys on a mobile phone, right? So you had to have amazing dexterity to play the game, right? So it kind of promised a lot, and it was kind of okay, but it, it kind of sucked as well. But you know what? After three or four years, it did actually reach profitability. So we did hustle and get it to the point where it worked. So don't take things personally. If someone says, look, you know, game's not up to much, doesn't mean to say you shouldn't self-publish it or put it in front of publishers. Go through that process. Get it done. Um, Colin was saying earlier, you know, you're judged on your portfolio. You're judged on the work you've done. Irregardless of who you are, what you look like, where you've come from, it doesn't matter. It's all about the game that you build. And if that game is amazing, then brilliant. If it's not, you can still do incredible things with it. And I think that'll set you up as well, because actually in the industry, you'll see a lot more failure, whether you are working for um, a bigger games business or whether you do your own thing, most of what you do will fail. My career is like walking, right? <laughs> you know, you walk and it's like every step is basically you fall and then you kind of catch yourself. That's what we've done. That's what we did over 16 years with TAG. We just kept falling forwards. And before you know it, you've actually gone a great distance. And you look back and go, wow, look how far we've come. But there's so many points of failure in that. You know, the, the folk that survive and then ultimately thrive and grow are the ones that can handle that disappointment, can handle that failure, that have a plan B and are able to kind of make their way through it. Um, so I don't want to leave you on a negative note. Um, as I said at the start, building your own games business, creating a game studio is, is probably one of the most incredible things you can do. It's probably second only to be like a rock star. Or, or these days, probably an influencer, right? Um, <laughs> I say this, I'm just back from GDC. I was there with my colleague, Omar. And um, you know, Omar's so high, he's got a big beard. Um, he wears quite flamboyant clothes. And I'm, I kid you not, almost everywhere we went, folk were like, Omar! We went to this party, we were literally like one yard in front of the door. And someone came running and going, Omar, it's you from Firestoke. He'd never met these people before in his life. <laughs> it's just insane. Um, not guaranteed that'll happen to you. Omar's quite distinctive, and I think he'd been speaking to a lot of people online before GDC setting up meetings. I'm sure he actually planted some of these people to make it look like he was really popular. But, so you might not get fame and fortune being in the games industry, but it's incredibly rewarding to create something from scratch that it's your baby, it's your thing that you've just formed out of nothing. And then to see other people play it and review it and love it, that's it's just incredible, right? And to own that whole process, Sometimes there'd be nothing better, but it comes at a cost, right? As Colin says, Sarah said, you know, it's hard, hard work. You know, you're gonna have to go harder. Um, you're gonna have to be more resilient, tougher than a lot of other people that are just getting a job. So it may not be for everyone, um, but if you do choose to go down that route, love to talk to you about it. Um, look me up on LinkedIn. I don't know if the details will be here or Twitter. I think it's Paul Farley or at Paul Farley. Hey, that's me. Um, and that's our website and stuff as well. So yeah, good luck. I don't know if there's any questions. Cool, yeah. Uh, for people that just came out of university, uh, we were playing games on television with two persons. Okay. That, that question always comes up. Um, I think you've just got to go with your gut instinct. You know, if you've got a good team coming out of university, you've made something you really believe in, it might suck, but you know, you've got something to work with, it's going to be harder later. It's definitely going to be harder later. Um, now, which probably wasn't the case 15 years ago or even 10 years ago, you've got access to Unity, Unreal, you've got GameSparks, PlayFab, you've got AWS, you've got Azure. I mean, you've got so many tools. You've got so much documentation, so much teaching is available online. I mean, there's nothing to stop you doing it straight out of Unity. I think you know, the, the thing that you don't have is just years of experience and the network. But if you're prepared to, to double down, then you can do it. I mean, Dundee has on our doorstep 
a number of different studios. So Sarah's from Hyperluminal, so you know Stuart and the guys there, um, you know, straight out of Abertay, uh, pocket-sized hands, straight out of Abertay. The biggest successes straight out of Abertay, Ninja Kiwi or Digital Goldfish, as I remember them. Um, Dave and Barry. Now, Dave and Barry, just normal folks. Yeah, they're just normal guys from Dundee. Um, did they get lucky? No, they worked damn hard. I mean, one of them was working at Nine Wells as a porter, and the other one was stacking shelves in Tesco's and running the studio by day and doing a part-time job at night just to make their way through. You know, there's a cost to pay. It's not easy. Um, but they really made it. And it may not have worked out that way, but it did. So I think, um, yeah, there's nothing to stop you. I think if you are doing it the way I did it, it's a lot harder. Like if you have a pregnant wife and a mortgage uh, and a good, well-paid job and you're comfortable, I think that's that's harder. It's definitely harder. Um, but you know, either works. You can do it. I mean, I think we're seeing more and more folk leaving you know, AAA or larger studios and publishers to set up on their own. And you know, why not? Um, it's totally achievable. So, is your question? No, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what else? Yep. Okay, so the question is like um, for Firestokes as a publisher, what's the minimum maximum that we fund? Yeah. Um, so again, it's quite flexible. Um, we we could um, take on opportunities where there's no development funding required. So if you funded it, the game's pretty much finished, and you just want marketing support and porting, QA, localization support. Um, then we can do that, although it's not our preferred option, but you know that that is possible. And if you actually have a game that's pretty much finished, talk to me or you know look me off online because we're actually looking for a couple of games this year, so they'll need to be almost finished now. Um, that's the sales pitch over. Uh, <laughs> the the question that how far? So we're funding up to about oh gosh, I mean again, it's it depends a lot on on the game, the team, and everything else. I mean probably to 300, 350,000 pounds at the moment, so about up to around about half a million dollars. Um, our sweet spot's probably about 250. Um, you know, what, we, what we've seen actually is there are a lot of uh, publishers that were in that space like Curve and Team 17, um, Anna Perna, Devolver, that are all kind of like now moving up into sort of triple I, which is like, you know, one to five million. So there's a real nice opportunity with, with smaller indie teams. And I think, as I said earlier, because folk have access to amazing tools, now what you can actually build with a team of three or four people in a you know, year and a half or two years is incredible, right? And what we're also seeing at the same time is that um, in indie games, people don't necessarily always want a 40 hour experience. They're quite happy to pay like you know, 15 pounds, $20 for a game that gives them four to eight hours of great gameplay. If the game's high quality and they love it, you know, the actual length of the game is pretty much irrelevant. And, and that's what we've seen you know, from the market data that we've been looking at recently. Um, so small games, high quality games, are really good. That's our sweet spot. That's what we're looking for. Um, but it's a range. And I think, again, um, compared to maybe even five, 10 years ago now, the landscape to get funded as a game studio is just incredible, right? So you've got you know, publishers like us that will fund you know, from smaller amounts up to maybe half a million. You've then got larger publishers that kind of do you know, like one to five million. Um, and then you've got the, you know, the triple A's or the double A publishers that will fund you know, beyond that. So at every stage, there's publisher funding available. But in terms of, and we haven't talked about investment, but if you want to get investment into a studio and you're super ambitious and you want that, then there's now angel investors. So people like myself and others that have kind of come through the industry for a number of years, that have exited a couple of times, sold a couple of businesses, might have just small amounts of money to invest into companies that are doing that. And you not only get the money, but you also get some of their experience in their network, which is a nice benefit as well. Or much larger VC investors will put you know, millions or tens of millions into your company. Um, there's opportunities with things like UK Games Fund. Um, there's match funding left, right, and center. It's all out there. I mean, the problem that you have is that it's all over the place. So figuring out where the money is and how to get it is the hard thing. But I would say to, you know, to anyone that um, is starting out, if you can get 25 grand and find a way to match fund that and get to 50, you're up and running. You know, once you've got 50K, that's a pretty small amount of money, but it'll get you started. It'll get you, you know, starting to move. 
then it's like, okay, can you speak to the bank? Can you speak to family and friends? Can you speak to other angel investors? Can you get to 100K? And it's just that constant um, momentum that you can start to build. But yeah, the opportunity is amazing. If not with Firestoke, um, there are plenty of other alternatives as well, but they're not as good as us. <laughs> It doesn't matter. No, no, no. Um, I think it's like portfolio. It's, you know, quality speaks, right? So for us, we've got a very clear set criteria in terms of the games we want to publish. Um, as I said, short, joyful, um, social or shareable games. Um, we're not um, signing anything that's targeted at teenage boys. So we don't want shooters, anything particularly violent. Uh, we don't want deep simulation or hardcore strategy games. So we've got a very clear vision of who we're about and the brand that we're building. Um, but in terms of the team, the main thing is their talent and their culture and their attitude. Absolutely. So our first game was actually signed with a developer in Malta, of all places. Um, he's one guy. Um, he was already in the industry. He came out of the industry because he was burnt out. And he decided he wanted to make a game for his kids. Um, it's a brilliant story. And uh, he's a really lovely guy, but you know, from day one, his attitude was just like, yeah, I, I just just want to work with other people. I want to soak in, you know, your experience and your input. Um, I just need someone to go on this journey with me. And he wasn't really looking for a lot of money, but he just wanted others to share that with. And uh, he's very good technically, but his design sucks. And we've got two people on our team that are ex-game designers that were able to help him. Um, so it worked out really well. The other team's four people in Bristol, um, and the other teams we're looking at are. Yeah, it doesn't matter where you're located, um, how many people are in your team, you know, what your background is, you know, it, it just, none of this stuff matters anymore. It just doesn't matter. And I think the great thing, you know, since the pandemic, um, you, know, you don't even have to meet people in person. So GDC was on last week. It was great. Really good to see people again. But you know what? You know, we've met people and signed games without ever meeting them and we'll continue to do so. Don't know how we're doing for time. I don't know if there's any more. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you so much, Paul. That was brilliant. So much good advice there. Hopefully, really useful stuff for you from both sides, whether you want to start um, in a studio or go it alone. Um, some really, really great stuff there. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be as wise or as insightful. I'm following two really great um great very natural speaker so i'll do my best hopefully there's some really useful stuff in here for you guys um as you guys will know we are into games you may know us from such titles as into games the video game and into games 2 electric boogaloo i'll let you into a little secret i made that joke at the last event so you guys are hearing it fresh but the people who've been here since five are groaning right now <laughs> so just make the same joke twice um I'm basically here to talk to you about um, how to get into games, funnily enough. Um, if you didn't know us already, we are into games, and we really exist to make the road into the games industry easier, more accessible, more inclusive, and hopefully more fun. It can be pretty grueling out there, so we like to think that we make that process a little bit more fun and a little bit more interesting. Um, why games? Uh, I don't really need to answer that question for you guys, otherwise you wouldn't be here. There's so many reasons to want to work in the games industry, a hugely exciting, collaborative, incredible industry, but there are some roadblocks and some barriers along the way which we try to make a little bit easier for you. Um, okay, so uh, this is like a sideways thumb. I didn't want to do a down thumb because I was like, that's too, I didn't want any cons, but this is a kind of like, Ew. Not, not so good. So it's highly skilled, competitive industry. You need to specialize fast. You need to be good at what you do to get noticed. We've taught, heard from Colin already some great advice around that. Um, there's only 700 roles in junior positions available every year in UK studios. That's not a lot. And there's only 10 in Scotland. Um, so there's not a lot um, of jobs. So there's a lot of competition, lots of people going for the same roles. And as I said, you need to specialize quickly. So you need to know what it is that you want to do. Studios will love people who wear many, many hats and know how to do lots of different things, but it's not the thing that they're going to hire you for. They're going to hire you for that one thing that you're really good at that they desperately need. Uh, but some good things. It's a growing sector of over 150 different roles, both in core development and outside. There's a huge amount of roles out there, loads of things to choose from. It's above average starting salary. It's not bad money. Um, also, it, it, so one of the questions that we hear a lot is around how, what is the games industry doing to support people? We hear a lot of horror stories about crunch over time, you know, some really nasty stories about things that are happening in other studios. By and large, in the UK, 
things are pretty good, guys. You know, because it's a competitive industry, because they're looking for super talented people, they're in demand. You saw how many open jobs there were for programmers. You are gold dust to a studio if you're a programmer and they desperately want to keep you because they, they need you. So by and large in UK studios, you're going to get looked after pretty well. And finally, we can help. We can help make it easier. Um, and hopefully I'm going to talk through a few things that might help you do that. So uh, the first thing is get clear on your pathway, what it is that you actually want to do. As I said, there's 150 different roles there. And if you guys are studying at the moment and you're thinking, oh, I want to be a game designer or maybe I want to be a lighting artist or a narrative designer. If you're serious about getting into games when you graduate, decide what it is that you want to do now. What specialism is it that excites you the most? Because that is the thing that you're going to get hired for. Do you love doing lighting? Do you love doing rigging? You know, are you a game? Do you, do you like creating tools as a programmer or do you like creating get your programming for gameplay? You got to decide that stuff quickly because they're not going to hire, um, you know, guy who does can do a little bit of everything. They're going to hire a very specific person with a very specific set of skills. So understand what role it is that you want to do quickly and um, uh, and start working on that as quickly as you can. Um, next one is share your skills wherever you can. If you guys aren't doing this already, I highly, highly recommend it. Colin has talked loads about what you can be doing to networking. Networking is marketing. Um, it, it, how many guys here have a portfolio? Okay, if your hand is not raised, then you're doing something wrong. You should have a portfolio if you want to get into the games industry. It is your business card. It's the thing that you show to employers. It should be at the top of your application. It's the thing that they're going to click on and go, hmm, what do we want to see? And, and as you said, you don't have long to surprise people or interest people. Your portfolio is the key to getting you a job in the games industry. Whether you're a programmer, a designer, an artist, it doesn't matter. You need to have a space and a place where you put your work. A few tips on portfolios. Keep it short, keep it sweet, keep your best work in there and always, always update it as well. Use industry standard tools. If you're a programmer, get your work on GitHub. If you're a designer, create games, publish them on itch.io, put playable links at the start of your application. Um, if you're an art artist, use ArtStation. Personal websites are great as well, but ultimately you need to be driving people to them. No one's gonna be like, oh, we really need a game designer at the studio and they're gonna search um, game designer and it's going to come up with your personal website oh you know i'm jim i'm a game designer no one is going to find your website unless you send them the link so websites are great but don't expect people to just stumble across your portfolio on your website and go oh, we're going to hire that guy because it won't happen get your portfolio out there share your skills wherever you can join game jams um uh, get involved in project programs network etc 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 get your get in front of people um, otherwise, they won't see you. Um, so next up, I'm going to talk a few things about what studios love to see. So when a game, when we, we talk to game studios a lot, we work with hundreds of games employees across the UK, and they're always telling us the things that they want to see. We've done thousands of careers talks, workshops, Q and A's. We're speaking to industry professionals all the time about what it is that they want to see from people when they look at applications. So hopefully, building on some of the great stuff that Colin said there already. Studios like people that can work in a team. Um, this is hugely, hugely important. If you guys aren't doing team projects already, you should be. Because, you know, there are, as, as um, Paul said, there are very few people who go out alone as one single person. Those are the exception to the rule. The vast majority of people, if you ask them one thing they'll tell you about working, you know, in the games industry, it's collaborative. That's why people love it so much. It's people from loads of different disciplines working together pretty seamlessly, even though they're all doing very specialized, complex, different things. So take any opportunity that you can to work in a team. Game jams are the best way to do that. You're essentially boiling down the game development process or the games industry cycle into a short little kind of competition. Don't burn yourself out doing millions of them. Don't worry about that. Just do some regularly enjoy them, bring in team members, experiment with new skills, try new things out, um, and get your games out there and finish them. Please finish them, guys. Finish the games. Just get something finished, published out there. If you love it and you want to improve it, you can do that. You can do that retroactively. You can add new things to the game, improve it, talk about that, but just finish the damn game, guys, and put it online. 
Um, so studios like people that can work in a team. I can't recommend that enough. And you can learn that in other jobs as well. If any of you are working at, you know, Costa or anything like that, you know, being able to communicate clearly with people and work together with others is a massive, massive skill, a soft skill that you're not going to learn in the lecture hall at Apatay, guys. Next up, studios like people that are social and have other interests. Tick, already you guys are here, you're talking, you're networking, well done. You've done one, one, of, that, one of those things already. But studios like to see people that have websites, are on Twitter. It, it, who here has an a industry Twitter profile? Not enough years. You should all have one. That is where people in the games industry communicate, talk, showcase their work, find out about events, find out about job listings. It's a great place for you to build an identity online. So I highly recommend, guys, getting a, a, a Twitter account talking about the work that you do on there. What have you been up to? You know, sharing content, adding developers that you like, get involved in the community. It's a really super simple, easy way to do it. Um, and, and studios like to see it. They will look you up. They will look up your name if you get to interview. They're going to want to see if you have a social media presence and what you're talking about. So studios like people that are social and have other interests. I say other interests because I guess it's very easy, I think, to make, I guess, games my identity. But studios want to see the other stuff that you like as well. What are the other things that inspire you and interest you and how have they driven you to where you are today? You know, they like to see people who have other interests. Um, and here's some examples of some great portfolio websites that you can check out. Um, OK, so again. Um, studios like people that are social and have other interests. Hobbies, be proud and showcase your interests and hobbies, the things that you like to do outside of games. If you ask a level designer what inspires them most when they're creating levels, then they're likely probably not going to tell you another game. They're going to tell you an architecture book that they read, you know, or a building that they saw. Um, if you ask uh, a narrative designer what inspired them to create a, 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 you know, a piece of work in a game that they're working on, they're going to tell you a piece of poetry I read or something, you know, a, a news story, or, you know, any, anything, it's likely, less likely to be another game than, um, than something else. So get interested, have other interests, let those inspire you, talk about them, be passionate about them, let those drive the conversations when you're talking to studios. And then, secondly, studio life. So the, the best studios are looking for candidates who are good culture fit for them. It, you'll notice that game studios have all had very specific identities, values have been talked about a lot. They decide, decide very early on what it is that, that they are as a studio, who they want to work with. You know, Bringing somebody into your business to do a job for you is, you know, is, is a difficult thing to do. And you want to bring in somebody that you're going to get along with and that you're going to enjoy working with. So just simple things like being friendly and personable and kind and asking questions, being inquisitive, is going to make you stand out and they're going to go, oh, this person's interesting. This person's got something about them. You know, they might discount the fact that you might not have all the technical skills that they need on an application because they remembered you in an interview. They were like, oh, that guy was great. You know, that person was really good. And I, I want to work with them because they believe in the same things that we do. So it's not just about kind of presenting yourself in a way. It's about, you know, you're in, as much as you are interviewing for a role, you know, you want to make sure that they're a good fit for you too. Is this a, a company that I want to work for? Is this a company that I believe in? Do I share the same values and mission as them? And sell yourself to them if that's the case. Look, I love what you guys do. I want to work with you because I love your culture. I love the way that you work. So think about these things, you know, make sure that you're personable, friendly, kind, inquisitive, you ask questions and get yourselves out there and let people know who you are. Um, networking has been talked about already ad, ad, ad nauseum because it's just so valuable. Um, you know, your technical skills are important, but the things that you won't learn in Abate are things like networking, um, you know, how to communicate with people, conflict resolution, you know, um, building teams, you know, meet, meeting new people. All of this stuff is stuff that you just have to go out there and do, and it's such a hugely valuable soft skill to have. Making connections, working out who you want to work with, the kind of person that you want to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we've talked about networking a lot, but the reason why everyone has mentioned it is because it's so important, um, and you guys have done the first step to that already. Um, so I, I'm running out of time. I've got like a, some, my colleague Rosalie's got a piece of paper. She's holding up one minute, one minute. So I better, I better be quick. But if I can say one thing that I recommend that you guys do now whilst you are here is search intergames.org slash discord and sign up if you haven't already to the intergames discord. Get your phones out and join right now. All of the things that I mentioned that employers want to see, you can do on the intergames discord. 
We run regular weekly live panels where you can and, and Q and A's where you can ask questions directly to developers about their specific role, how they got into games, how you might be able to do the same thing as well. As well as that, we have discipline specific channels where you can talk to people who have the same interests as you and specialisms and ask them questions and collaborate on projects. We run regular bi-weekly design workouts where we create briefs for people to create pieces of work for their portfolio for, whether that's for audio, narrative, design, or programming, doesn't matter. And then anyone, look, this is the kicker, guys, and it's, it's ridiculous that there are you know, 6,000 people on our Discord, but very few of them are actually making use of some of these things. If you, t if you submit a piece of work to the Intergames design workout every fortnight, you are guaranteed to get portfolio feedback from an industry professional. And you can do that every single time, every single time. You know, we, we, all we can do is create these tools and create these things for you. It's up to you guys to go out there and grab them. You have to be proactive and say, okay, I want to do this. I want this role. I'm going to go out there and make use of this game jam, you know? And as Colin has said, people are getting interviews because they are seen to be active in these spaces. We've heard the same things as well. People are getting hired at studios because they said, you know, they come recommended from someone from Intergames, or we saw on their profile that they've done X project with Intergames. You know, get yourself out there and do these things. They're there for you. We're not just doing it because we're bored. We're doing it because these are the things that will help you get a job in games. So join the Intergames Discord, get involved in challenges, communicate, collaborate, et cetera, et cetera. So to recap very quickly, studios love people that share their skills, build a portfolio, get it out there, share it with people, get feedback from people is super important, especially the constructive stuff. Um, studios love people that can work in a team, take part in regular game jams, find classmates or people that you work with or enjoy collaborating with, make games with them, it's super important. And you won't learn that in the lecture hall, as I said. Studios love people that are social and have wider interests. Be interested and interesting. You know, love your hobbies, use them as inspiration for, you know, the creative work that you do and build an online presence. Get a Twitter profile, guys. Follow developers that you like. Join events. Get involved. And finally, studios love people that are eager to learn and build their skills. Like, they love to see people who are proactive. Games industry professionals are so proactive. They're always learning new tricks. They're always learning new things. It's a rapidly moving industry, and you have to stay up to date. They're always doing little free online courses or, you know, talking in a Twitter thread about something that they learned and work, a new tool that they found out, you know, a new workflow and something, whatever. You know, they love to see people that are always like, oh, maybe I'll try this little thing out. Oh, I thought I'd try out, you know, rigging for a change and see what that was like. They love to see that. People who are proactive about always learning and flexing their skills. And the best place that you can do all of these things is on the Intergames Discord, intergames.org slash Discord. Everything that we do is free, and it's all for you guys to help you get a job in games. So please make use of it. Um, that's me, guys. Hopefully, all that's useful. Don't have any time for questions. I'm, I'm not sure. But if you want to grab me or anyone else from Intergames, um, then we'll be here until the end of the event. Um, we're at 20 to 9 now, so there's still a few beers left. There's some cans of iron brew. Um, there's some shortbread. So please grab anyone that you wanted to talk to, ask some questions. You know, make do all these things that are here uh, whilst you've still got time before nine o'clock. Huge thanks everyone for coming along and to the stream as well. Hi, mom. Um, thanks all for coming along. Uh, it's been a wonderful night, guys.